but the negotiation and sales process can be something where you just want to put on like a 19 year old dude move on a Friday night and some chick at the bar for a one nighter. Like that's not what we do in the business guys and girls. It's not how it works. And so, you know, that's where all of what I've just outlined in the seven points above, this is how we want to uh, close this deal. So maybe it will help you dudes on a Friday, you know, who knows? We'll see. Maybe get back to me. Send me an email, max at businessforbuilders.ca and let me know how the negotiation podcast helped you with your dating life. <laughs> how old are you going to be before you start to experience life like you want it? I want to tell you right now, whether you like it or not, there is a better way to do business. Hi everyone, welcome to the Business for Builders podcast. Welcome to you if you're in YouTube land. So good to be with you. Uh, my name's Max. I am the CEO at Smith & Sons Canada, Smith & Sons Remodeling Experts, if you will. And uh, I hope you're doing well. I hope your business is going good. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be an exciting year, I think, for a bunch of reasons. So I'm sort of really looking forward to it. As usual, uh, like and subscribe. Uh, leave your comments uh, down below. They will hit my inbox and I will promptly get back to those. I'm getting better at responding to YouTube comments. And certainly, uh, here's something different. If you're on your, whatever, wherever you listen to podcasts, be sure to go and I think, you know, give us a bit of love there. I think you can sort of give us a pat on the back if you're liking what you're hearing. And uh, that really sort of helps us uh, move forward with this podcast show as well. Uh, as usual, want to give you steak and potatoes. Don't forget uh, Business for Builders VIP Facebook group. Head across there. Uh, if, you, uh, if you're if you a good sort, I'll let you in. It's a good place for community, colla- uh, co- co- a little bit of collaboration between general contractors and obviously, uh, some uh, yeah, there, there's some really good support in there. If you've got any questions, you can ask a greater group, which is always a good thing. Um, I am considering, and this is breaking news, I am considering a mastermind group, and there might be a small fee associated with that. Uh, it, it, it sort of it goes down that avenue of some a little bit more uh, specific coaching, if you will. We might get around a round table, so uh, just keep keep that one in mind. Uh, planning on looking uh, at launching something like that maybe in the next three months. So uh, that's pretty exciting news. We'll probably announce that via the uh, Business for Builders VIP Facebook group. So as like I started out saying, uh, let's get cracking with some steak and potatoes today. I'm going to be chatting with you about uh, negotiation. Uh, I think there's a lot of, I think it's something that's a little bit uh, intangible as far as the subject matter goes. We know that we we do it every day, but we don't really uh, we don't think about breaking it down or pulling it apart, if you will, and really understanding some aspects around the the process of negotiation, the goals, and some of the work that we need to do within that negotiation with clients specifically. Um, if you're talking to general, uh, if you're talking to subcontractors, yes. If you're talking to some vendors or suppliers, it certainly does. Uh, it is relevant there as well. So I've got seven tips for you guys and gals today. So negotiation, what is it? It's the discussion aimed at reaching an agreement. Like it's pretty deep. Um, I think we we do it fairly uh, intuitively and we do it fairly subconsciously. Um, but we, uh, we're we going to nail down some tips and hopefully these will help you navigate your next negotiation. Um, you know, one book that came to mind that I've read is The Art of the Deal by Donald Trump. Now I've got that in hard copy and I've got that also on Audible. Um, and it's a li- it's it's a it's a pretty lit up kind of book. It you know he talks a lot about what he did in negotiation, some of his bigger deals in in uh, Manhattan and things like that. Uh, so it's a pretty interesting read, and you just take it with a pinch of salt. But I have read that book. I've listened to the audio book as well. Um, but we're just going to nail down on a few a few areas that uh, a few uh, stages that you might need to think about, just so that you can actually get some. Uh, really documented approach. And we always talk about having your sales process documented and everything like that. So I'm going to quickly run through in the next 15 minutes these seven tips, and that will help you understand maybe some of the requirements in the negotiation, but it'll also help you maybe define or help you navigate your way through. Um, I always talk about there's two parts to a, 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 a the sales process. One is sales itself, and then the other one is the closing stage. And you've got to know when you flick those when you as a human start hearing things that resonate with you that, that starts bringing to, to your attention the fact that, okay, the client is now in the buying mode or the buying mode and is, is now this is the right time 
to start uh, moving towards that close, which means you, you, your negotiation side of things is pretty well because you're moving towards that agreement stage. So uh, let's get cracking. Seven tips. I'm going to run through them super quickly. Um, so if you're between jobs, I'll try and get it done uh, and you're on the road, I'll try and get this done before you uh, you run out of road. So uh, here we go. Prepare and research. Um, you've got to gather as much information about the project. Now, if you are in new homes, some of the data that you'll have regarding the project can be fairly uh, rhetorical or fairly, fairly repeatable, whereas in renos, the principle is the same, but the project can be vastly different. So it's case by case, right? So you've got to look at also, you know, what what kind of, uh, you know, what are the market conditions? Because in sometimes in some places we get people that have got really high end sort of, you know, desire to put in great, you know, products within their project, but they're not really living in an area that would maybe, you know, uh, that would require that. Uh, and it would be an overcapitalization. So um, it's always it's always good to understand where the clients, um, you know, where their needs and their preferences and their budget constraints are. So one thing that I use in doing my research, it helps me when I think about if I can, if I can, and I say this to clients, if I can figure out, you know, where where we're at financially with the cost of the project and it suits your financial capabilities or wherewithal, great. If it's very functional and it works for you and the new design and the new layout is going to do what it needs to do for you, that's great. Tick that box. And of course, the the last thing is it's got to be aesthetically, you know, pleasing. You can't just have a, something that fits their budget that works well that's ugly as sin, right? So those are the three things that I help to just prepare myself and I go, okay, what is it about this project? What's the number? What are they looking for as, as far as a finished product look? And, and you know, what what's the functionality uh, priority around, you know, that 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 project completion. So, because um, what we're trying to do is where, I say to my guys all the time, right at the beginning, when we first meet the client, if you can, if you're watching this on YouTube, I've, I've, you know, you're about like, it's like this, you're this, you're this far apart. But as time goes by, as you move forward, and you're, you know, you're, you're six feet apart, let's say, as you move forward, the idea is to move to a point where you get to that agreement stage, where you start to get closer and closer to actually doing a deal. And so, you, you know, preparing and researching around the client and the project, <clears throat> maybe what you've done some ba- for, from some historical data, that will help you get in the right headspace when you do meet with the client. Um, that helps to uh, close the deal. Research the industry standards, local regs, uh, you know, any competitive landscape that you might be a part of. So you might be quoting against a couple of other guys or gals or companies. Um, what I tend to do is trying to take, I, I try to pluck that client off the market. If they're in my preferred client profile, uh, I will I will do that in such a way that it means they're only dealing with one builder and that would be me. And that is a little bit of a, uh, a part of our sales process too, but I'm not here to cover that. So, yeah, the, the knowledge uh, that knowledge will empower you to make an informed decision during the negotiation process. So, the, you know, the, the more understanding that you have of the the, the project and, and past projects that are similar to this one and, you know, your municipality challenges that you might have to, with getting permits and things like that, that will set you up as uh, more of an authority-looking type builder as you move into that and as you kick things off. Right, so uh, I think what you've got to do in your mind, this point number two, to find clear objectives, you've got to establish your goals and priorities for the negotiation. So, uh, you know, uh, this could be a fairly repetitive type of, uh, you know, point where you're defining the clear goals. Um, for us, we have very much a, a design and plan, uh, you know, a design and plan phase, which is pre-construction, which is essentially where we offer our quantity takeoff service, where we go and get all the materials list, the bill of quantities, and the, and the, we, work, we calculate the labor. Now, we do charge a fee. That's what it's called. It's a service, and there's a fee for service. And so, you know, I, I really got to have some well-defined, um, you know, objectives to ensure that I don't get carried away. Literally, I took a phone call yesterday in the office. So where this is, uh, what are we recording this on a Tuesday morning? Took a, took a phone call yesterday and the lady's already saying to me, oh, she's already, uh, what was her point? I thought, well, that's getting ahead of the, you know, ahead of the game. Um, but she was so bullish. I, she was literally just ringing what I thought was to just give me her details so that one of my GCs could get out there and talk to her and see her. See her. And, and she was already, like, she was really pushing to get started. Now, for me, that's exciting, of course, but there's a part of me that instantly goes to, whoa, whoa. Because immediately, I'm thinking, 
Um, I'm a little suspicious around that. I want to make sure that I'm happy to work for this person. I do have a choice in that regard. So, um, you know, for me, I've got some objectives that I want to, uh, you know, I've got some milestones or some objectives that I want to hit, but I want to hit them in accordance with my system. And I've said it before that that the client will buy in accordance with my selling process. I don't sell in accordance with my client's buying process. And that personality that I, had, I chatted with on the phone yesterday, she was very bullish, which is great. But what I've got to do is I've got to harness that horsepower and make her buy in accordance with my selling process. That's key. Number three, listen and understand. I think this is where we kind of, you know, if we've done those first two points really well, we can sort of go in there fairly uh, bullish or, or a fairly in a, in a bombastic fa fashion. However, um, what we've got to make sure is that when we're when we're listening to clients, that we are actually hearing okay we don't just sort of stop talking so they can talk so that you can think about the next thing that you're going to say did you catch that that that's a problem for us us bullish guys because we just want to we want to lead from the front no problem the problem is negotiation is this two-way street so if i am to bring a, a negotiation forward and we are to meet at a point whereby we can we can actually sign off on a deal then it's got to be good. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit down the track too. But I need to listen and understand. And I, I see it uh, probably more often than I'd like to, but I think we assume that we know best for the client. And we've actually, I'll tell you what we've heard a lot of. Clients will say to us, I met with one of my GCs for lunch yesterday, and he, he is uh, currently taking a job off uh, another company um, through, just through good negotiations, listening and understanding. Like that is literally what... Uh, he is doing because the lady said to my general contractor that they 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 didn't listen to anything I had to say. They didn't come back with a, a proposal that reflected what I needed. And so, you know, clearly the person that went in there to do that con consultation has just looked at the job and went, I know what's best for this person. And, 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 and there is some merit in understanding that you are an authority and yes, you do have historical data and experience. That's great. But you need to transfer the information that you've got in your dome to the client in such a way that doesn't offend. So listening to them, understanding them, and and then trying to, hey, this is a classic question I would say. I say, look, there's some great ideas. If I if I if I thought I had some ideas that might be able to help you as far as the design that might be just a little bit different to what you're talking about, but might work better, would you be happy to have a listen to those? And if I can get an agreement in principle from them or, an, or a, an acceptance that they're happy to listen to me, then I've got a chance of at least ne you know, negotiating that small aspect of the overall negotiation as well. So we want to actively listen. That's what I'm talking about. We don't just sit there and stop talking so we can start thinking about the next thing we're going to say. We literally got to process everything that's coming out of their mouth and really understand what their pain points are. Like the, a lot of the time, I mean, I took, I think we, we took about 10 10 leads, 10 or 11, you know, in brand new inquiries yesterday, some on the internet, some on the phone. And, uh, you know, I I often start the, the conversation, whether it's on the phone or whether it's in person, it's like, tell me what you love about your home and tell me what you hate about it, like as far as it relates to the scope of work. So that really does get them started. And I enjoy that active listening because it's helping me with pain points because I'm about being solution orientated and I want to really understand where they're coming from. So effective communication and empathetic listening builds rapport and trust and it makes the negotiation process smoother. So really it's empathy. Find out what's important to them, make it important to you and then do your job at the highest level. <clears throat> big, That's a big deal. So listen and understand point number three. Point number four, we want to build win-win solutions. Like I said, people are coming to us and I've got one yesterday that said, hey, we're looking for design ideas. You know, for me, I, you know, when I'm in the process of walking around with the clients and I'm looking at the project and I'm listening to what they're saying and where their pain points are and I'm really trying to process, it does take me a little bit of time. Not that I want to go and be the designer on the day, but there is a part of me that's going to look at entry points and exit points and views and, and just how does the functionality really work into what we're trying to do and design here? And so for me, it's it's finding out what's important. And then there's a process of, well, you know, what is easier for me to build that's more cost effective for them as well. That's a win-win solution. If I can find out that there's something that I can build more easier 
than what they were exe- putting down and it fits within their budgets, the aesthetic value and the functionality, automatically we're going to have a win-win process there. And so it's super important that you get a mutually beneficial outcome. Um, and so instead of you know uh, adopting an adversarial type mindset where it's like my way or the highway, and I know we don't do that on purpose, but we we subconsciously we do it, and I've got to I've got to do a, a, a one of these recording shows on um, your state of consciousness from being uh, unconsciously incompetent to, to unconsciously competent, because I think we go in there and we just don't listen to ourselves and we don't realize that we're talking. You know, if you love to talk, do a podcast because there's nobody here to interrupt me. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> so I can, I've got my guy behind the camera just shaking his head. But it's the freaking truth. I could just waffle on all day. And I don't have to listen to anybody. So, but I hope I'm making some sense here. So you want to look for creative solutions that address both sides, you know, or both parties' interests, if you will. It's super important that people understand that they're being heard and that, you know, and and so I love to summarize at the back end of a meeting. So, so it's like, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner, just let me get this right. So what you want to do is we want to knock that window out. We, we want to, because we're going to put in there some, some French doors, or we're going to put on these stacked doors, and you want to be able to walk out there, and then you want a better access, you know, from upstairs to downstairs. So we want to knock that wall out. And then we want to renovate the bathroom. Is that have I got that? Have I got that right? It's always nice to get watch the body language. Um, if there's some hesitation in their response, you know you haven't nailed it. So this is why it goes back to point number three, which is listening and understanding. You then you might have to back up and go around that again just to make sure that you actually do understand. You don't walk out with the wrong understanding. Um, so you know if you can if you can emphasize value and you can find common ground with the client at the back end and you're on the same page, you'll increase your chances of reaching uh, an agreement that satisfies both parties, and that's super important. Okay, point number five, you've got to be flexible and adaptive. Your ego is not on your design. Um, too many times I see this with architects. They just they just charge off in some direction because they have a vision to to draw that that project so that it makes them feel good and they apply zero empathy to what the clients want. And then the clients have paid 10 grand for a set of plans that aren't really what they they're not, it's not going in the direction that they want. And that's that's you know, that bothers me a lot. So you've got to be, you know, any negotiation is going to require some flexibility, some adaptability. Um, not all the terms and conditions are going to be negotiable. I understand that, you know, like I, I say often that the tail doesn't wag the dog. So there's going to be some things that I draw the line in the sand and go, right, that's not going to happen. Um, so, you know, you've got to figure out in the process of negotiation what you can be flexible uh, with and what you can't be. Um, but you've got to focus on the most critical critical aspects and you've got to prioritize going back to what your objectives are. So in some cases, sure, there might be some flexibility. You might be able to adapt to the needs and wants of the client. But in some cases, um, there's, there's, there's just things that just don't happen. This whole, I'll tell you something that stands out in my mind. When a client says, okay, that's great. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll call you back in a couple of weeks, you know, once I've, you know, seen your estimate and we'll make a decision or something like that. And it's like, no, 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 what I'll do is I will give you a call back in a week to go over the estimate that I've put together and run you through that really quick. Because normally the estimate for us is a bracketed price range and a, and a bullet point list of inclusions and a rough understanding of how long the, the job's going to take. So if you, un, if you want to know a little bit more about what we do in stages, the first meeting and then the estimate, which is a bullet point, it's a rough idea of how long. And a bracketed price range, working, you know, saying, well, your bathroom is going to cost between twenty and thirty thousand, or whatever the case may be. That for us now, after that, there is no, we don't do any more work after that, after that estimate for free. That's where we start offering, you know, in the design and and plan uh, or the design and quote process, we offer the quantity takeoff service. We we just don't go beyond that. So. We're not flexible in that regard, but you know, once we get into the, the the design and quote stage, the quantity takeoff service, we will. There is some flexibilities within that that we might comp the clients some some of our labour or something like that because it's very powerful that quantity takeoff service and the design and quote process because when you've got them to buy in, that's where you get full attention from the client and you're actually not competing with other builders in the marketplace. And that's good because we're not commodities. We're not a can of monster. We're actually a, we're actually a service oriented business, and you know our knowledge and uh, experience is worth something. So, 
Uh, there's an element you can't. You, you, you need to be flexible. You need to be adaptive, but you also need to understand the undertow, and that is that in some cases there is no room for. There's no wiggle room. There's no negotiation in that little micro part of that uh, whole negotiation. Point number six: communicate effectively. Um, I think builders have got they're good. They've got good hearts, but th they just fail to communicate. I sat in this office till probably 6.30, 7 o'clock. I had a big day. I had guys walking in. I had lunch with one of my guys. I had, uh, you know, overseas phone calls. But at the end of the day, I had to get those leads on the books of my guys. And so they they would have got that probably around dinner time. So, uh, you know, I, I know that sometimes it's tough, but we've got to make sure clients are like, and I don't want to disrespect our clients, but they're like plates on sticks. You've got to keep them, I don't know if you've seen that that video, but they're like plates sitting on sticks. And if you stop spinning those sticks, those plates will fall off the sticks. Clients are like plates on sticks and we need to make sure that our communication is effective and it's competent and it's not full of bloat. Don't tell them about your weekend. Just cut to the chase. Be kind and courteous, be, be, be very sort of, uh, you know, on point and have a very objective mindset when, you, when it comes to communication. Remember, they're busy as well. So don't fill their life up with BS. Cut to the chase. They only worry about the renovation, their project. They don't give a shit about your personal life or your dog or whatever. Um, they want to cut to the chase as well. And so it's important that you communicate clearly, concisely and effectively and ensure that, um, you know, remember what I say is that if, they, if clients could go to Walmart and buy their new home or their renovation project done and dusted and they could just pick it off the shelf and plug and play, they would. But unfortunately, uh, it's it's a necessary evil to involve guys and gals like us to actually oversee the project. So we want to make sure that um, the language that we use, um, it be benefits, uh, you know, the, highlights the benefits of your proposals and addresses your concerns. A lot of the time, some of the things that we find whilst we're in the meeting are a little bit, you know, on edge. We, we, we may not be able to modify that structural wall. We may not be able to... Uh, move closer to that boundary lot line because we're going to be outside the building envelope or whatever the case may be. Um, you've just got to make sure that you you don't you remove the grey area. That's what I would say. Now again, it's the way you know my old man used to say to me. Okay, son, you kind of you you blew that thing up. Uh, right message, wrong delivery. So think about your delivery. Don't undercook it. Don't overcook it. Try and make sure that you hit the pain points. You provide solutions. And it's done in such a way where there's there's no offence taken by the client. So it's about your tone of voice. Um, you know, uh, the more the the more they know. What's that saying? Um, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So I will talk about well, you know, and if we're doing a redesign, it'd be so, like if and I've got six kids, so I can talk from a family man standpoint. It's like well, you know, I would I think the kids would love this because I think the family would enjoy this this space at Christmas time because. And then you're starting to just, you know, and if they've got a big family and I've got a big family, then we've already got something in common. And so I can really relate. And they need to understand that you are relatable. Now, not all of us have got, you know, gone crazy like me and had six kids. So you might just need to think hard about, okay, what is it, you know, that I need to, what pain points do I need to relate to? And how am I going to, uh, you know, chat about those? So that's communicating effectively. Connection is what is super important. Um Right, so keep the lines of communication open and transparent throughout the negotiation process. Look, you need to find where you fit best and what fits best with your clients, or I think you need to have that that repertoire of communication points. Some people might like to use WhatsApp. Some people might use like to use what uh, just flat out emails. Um, you might have software that's got a client portal which you can communicate. I would recommend that. That's something that we have with uh, Build Exact. Um, it's a it's a very uh, it's a very user friendly. Everything's in one space. All the change orders are signed off there. Uh, any any communication around selections can be uh, chatted about within that, and it's all in one place. And it's very important that you keep that shit together because if you don't and you lose track, it's going to cost you money, guaranteed. Right, document the agreement. Obviously, there's you know not many of us that will go into a you know a fifty or hundred thousand dollar deal without some documentation. But guys and girls, um, you know, I subscribe to a fixed price lump sum contract. So, um, you know, we definitely document a lot of that. Part of our part of that close or, or the proposal is obviously the initial proposal for the job. We get an agreement in principle, then we move into contracts. In that contract, we've got specifications and inclusions. It includes a start date, potentially, and a finish date. 
Um, it also, uh, you know, outlines the the payment schedule so clients understand. Okay, this is the this is the down payment or the the, the contract signing amount, and here's the, the the different stages with the different amounts. So we've broken that down. So we've got to make sure that both parties have a clear understanding of the agreed upon terms. And in your estimate, you know, as well as in showing the inclusions, it also should spell out the exclusions. Um, to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Now, I would suggest that you spend as much time on, sh- uh, you know, talking about the contract as you did about the proposal. Don't spend a lot of time, uh, excuse me, spend a lot of time in the proposal, but don't move into the contract and just slip a 12-page document across the, you know, the table and say, here you go, sign here, here, and here. Um, I, I need to go through the major points within the contract, go get an initial on the payment schedule, get an initial on the change order policy, uh, so there's an understanding there that I did go through that with you. Uh, and then you can move to the point where you get that sign off and obviously the check on signing. So, uh, you know, well-drafted contract protects the interest of both the general contractor and the homeowner. Too often I see it, the builders just want to get a contract so they can get the, the, the client in a headlock. It's not it's not the, the deal. Um, this will minimize the chances of misunderstandings um, and disputes as you move forward. So I would really impress upon you the importance of uh, making sure that you do document the agreements uh, in a very organised fashion. Talk to your legal counsel about that. Um, and so, you know, what we're talking about here is it's a fairly long-winded process, the negotiation for me. And so what gives me uh, peace of mind is to know that when I've ticked all of my boxes throughout the design and quote and the planning stages and getting to the contract proposal and completing the negotiation – I know that my life in construction is going to be a lot simpler. We utilize the services of interior designers and, of course, anywhere there's engineers or surveyors or any of that, um, you know, those types of design service uh, providers because it that data actually makes my life easier as we go forward because I get a really good intimate understanding of the project before we actually turn, you know, turn soil. So, um, you know, I, I want you to understand that negotiation, it's the, you'll actually work harder, I think, in the negotiation phase than you will in construction because you're a natural construction operative, but the negotiation and sales process can be something where you just want to put on like a 19-year-old dude move on a Friday night and some chick at the bar for a one-nighter. Like, that's not what we do in the business, guys and girls. It's not how it works. And so, you know, that's where all of what I've just outlined in the seven points above, this is how we want to uh, close this deal. So maybe it will help you dudes on a Friday, you know, who knows, we'll see. Maybe get back to me. Send me an email, max at businessforbuilders.ca and let me know how the negotiation podcast helped you with your dating life. (laughs) Okay, remember, uh, negotiation skills will improve with practice, okay? So you, you don't get, like at the, the the highest levels within your industry because overnight you took a vitamin C pill and all of a sudden, bam, you're, you're a ninja, okay? So it takes, it, you know, it's like I've watched my kids go to the gym and, you know, um, it, it happens over time. They start to develop muscle mass and they start to, you know, you can see that there's a reward for their effort. So you've got to be patient with yourself because really making cock-ups is part of the deal. Uh, but it's it's assessing and then, you know, looking at what you did right and what you did wrong, it's going to help you actually improve. And so slowly but surely you climb that mountain. So reflect on your, your negotiation experiences, learn from them, refine your, imp- uh, your approach by implementing some of these tips or all of these tips, you can enhance your, enhance your chances of achieving, achieving successful negotiations as a general contractor. Hey, guys and girls, remember, hit me up, max at businessforbuilders.ca. Get across to the uh, Business for Builders VIP Facebook group. And uh, if you're a good sort, I'll let you in there. Be sure to leave comments below. Tick the bell. Maybe show us some love if you're on your uh, podcast platform. That would be appreciated. And uh, go build a kick-ass business. We'll see you on the next episode. Cheers. (laughs) 